Hello, I'm Richard with Evie for You Custom Conversions. And in this video, we're going to take a look at what happens after you leave lithium iron phosphate batteries in the desert for eight years. Well, I don't know yet, but we're about to find out. What I do know is, you know, my Carmen Ghia, which was driven for seven and a half years and 97,000 miles with the same kind of cells, very impressed with these cowed cells. So anyway, uh, and those cells, by the way, even though we sold the Carmen Ghia, we removed all the conversion components and they are now in my bug. And all those components are still on the road with over 100,000 miles on them, still going strong. But what happens on a vehicle that sat more than it was driven? And it was not garaged, it sat out in the Mojave Desert. Eight years in the desert. Let's see what, uh, what happens. And this is just uh, another video in this series. So we're not going to know, you know, uh, the, the bottom line yet. We're going to see, you know, this is, this is taking a benchmark. Let's see where these cells are today. And then once we re get the uh, motor back from being repaired, we're going to have uh, an opportunity to cycle these cells. And that will be the true test. We'll you know, run them and, and, and see how they perform. We know, uh, you know a lot about this vehicle because we happen to have featured it in a video. So we have a lot more documentation that we do on, on, on most vehicles. So we know exactly how this thing performed eight years ago and it's going to be interesting to see how it compares today. So here's the cell legend from the operator's manual and it shows all 38 cells. It shows that there's a fuse between the the pack and then there's also a fuse going to the inverter and so we you know all the cells are identified the wirings identified you know their location and we've numbered them so let's go take a look at the cells and then we'll take a look at the readings that we've taken from this so here's the driver's side and so we have the slide out and you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So nine times two because there's two rows. So that's 18. And then there's 20 on the other side. We loaded the passenger side a little bit heavier because we couldn't split it with an even number, so we got nine on this side, 10 on that side, and two rows, so we've got 18 and 20, total of 38 cells. And this is just how they looked. All that we've done is we put a meter on here, and that's kind of hard to get my arm in there and, and, uh, and, and read the meter and everything, so I didn't film it, but you can see how we've got the covers here, so if this cover were to come down, it can't short out. We loosened the straps so we could pull these out. We've got both sides extended at the moment, so we'll walk around the other side and take a look at it. But um, yeah, we've, we've now taken readings off each of the cells. So you can see the foam on the ground for me to kneel on. Old guy, don't like kneeling on concrete. <coughs> Excuse me. So we've got the cells again extended out here on our glides. These glides, I forget, you have to look at the original videos we did of this, but this is way overkill. These can handle much, like over double the weight that we actually have on them. And, uh, and so there's the cells. We can reach all of them in there. And I will go in and check the torque on all of these, these interconnects see how they are 
but we're going to show you the readings on all of these and let you know what the uh, voltage is on each of these individual cells. And remember, these have been in this uh, treasure chest for eight years. So let's take a look at how they've done in eight years. Okay, so let me go over what we've done. What we did was we measured the pack voltage back at the, uh, the disconnect switch and, and the negative. So uh, we didn't measure at the pack, we measured at the inverter, or at the switch. And so the voltage in the back was measured at 125.8 volts. That's what we measured a month ago when we got the vehicle. And so we just got around to doing all this. And so I measured all 38 cells as per the cell identification that you saw on our, uh, our original legend. And so you can see they all 3.3 volts, 3.1 volts, 3.29. We have two that were at 3.28. And so I have the breakdown right here. There were 17 cells at 3.3 volts for 56.1 volts. We had eight that were 3.31 volts for 26.5. And if you do the math, you'll see that we've done some rounding. And we've got 3.29, uh, 11 of those for 36.2 volts, and the two at 3.28 for 6.6 .6 volts, which add these up that gives us 125.4 volts. So we have a, a description here a, discre a discrepancy here of 0.4 volts and that's due to the measuring and rounding and you know some of those terminals you know the parts where I was putting my probes on may not have been the best connection you know so might be a little bit of an error there but basically you can see that uh, the current pack, the way it's sitting, I don't know how many, you know, I don't know the state of charge. I don't know how many amp hours have been drawn out of the pack, if it was completely charged and just left sitting. I don't know. I don't have any of that provenance. But I do know that this is the current status. And so what we're going to do is, as I just mentioned, is, is I'm going to torque all those uh, interconnects and we're going to slide everything back together, snug it down, and then we're going to continue to wait for the motor to come back. And once the motor is, is returned from being repaired and upgraded, we're going to, oh, the next thing I do is, is that we're going to plug the pack in and, and see if it'll charge. So we're going to top it off and then once the motor is received, we're going to cycle these cells. Go out and use them and discharge it and charge it. And we'll do you know a few cycles. And then we'll again go back in and check the, uh, and, and we'll do it on the low side. We'll check it, not on the top end, but at the bottom end, and, and see, see what it looks like. But I pretty much knew without doing these individual readings because you take this voltage here and you divide it by 38 that told me that it was basically you know uh, that 3.3 that volts you know average and so uh, I knew things were where they should be so that's good news so far but the real test will be in cycling these cells and seeing how they respond and seeing uh, the current capacity, see what kind of uh, uh, amp hours we're getting out of the cells. So this is just the benchmark. We're just taking some uh, you know figures to see where things stand as received. Well, everything's back snug in the old treasure chest. The uh, interconnects are good 
pays to use good quality hardware and those Nordlock washers don't let us down. There she is. All right. So we installed the new 12 volt battery and we're charging it right now. Um, and we're charging the traction pack also. So we checked the pack voltage we checked individual cell voltages and so we've recorded all that but there's no way to know what the state of charge is so now we're charging the pack and that's the current going into the pack um, it's a 2.5 kilowatt charger and we're charging at 110 volts so you know 110 AC so we'll uh, see how much I zeroed this out. So we'll see how many amp hours uh, we put in. And so that's the next step until we receive the motor and can, you know, cycle these things. But we want to start off with the pack full. Because like I said, there's no way to know what the state of charge is based on the voltage alone. This was a unique conversion in a lot of ways. And uh, <laughs> especially where the charge port was. The original owner of the vehicle, uh, he actually put a piece of blue tape right there. He was very specific where he wanted that charge port. And, and it was 100, you know, he wanted a 110, a stage one charge port. And, you know, tried to talk him out of it. You know, not a good idea to put a charge port in the bumper. And so since we, you know, converted the car, and we had originally, you know, after we mounted that in the bumper, or after we cut the hole for it, we had painted the bumper because the bumper needed some freshening up. So we removed it and painted it. So we know that, you know, an example of why you don't want to put a charge port in the bumper, that the back end, either he hit something or something hit him. But, you know, that's what bumpers are for. So anyway, it's there. That's where we're plugged in currently. Uh, we're going to add a J1772 charge port. Let me show you where we'll put that. Well, this is the location of the original fuel port and we left you know that part of it in place still got the original locking gas cap on there and we just put this piece on top and so that's a good location for the JLD 404 uh, JLD4, for the J1772 and it's not that far from where the charger is inside of this you know treasure chest so it won't be a very long run and that's what we're gonna do eh, when I get some free time let me show you how we're charging this actually we're actually charging this because I couldn't reach an outlet the transporters up on ramps and the uh, Transaxle is being supported by a jack because the motor has been removed and we didn't have a, a heavy enough long enough extension cord to reach an outlet so we rolled our um, backup power supply here to you know be within reach of the cord and we're plugged in this is a 12.8 kilowatt hour uh, battery pack with a 6,000 watt inverter and so this is no issue to charge that battery pack um, and we'll see how much it's going to take so anyway that's uh, that's what we're doing while we wait for the motor to be repaired and returned 
And so we'll see if um, we have time to put that J1772 charge port in because uh, I'd like to have that going forward.